So which verse is it on the board? I have told you it's six. Is that correct? Yeah, <laughs> 
famous for religious life and in the Puranas and the histories as well for you have gone through them under proper guidance and have also explained them purport a Goswami or the bona fide representative of Sri Vyasa Deva must be free from all kinds of vices the four major vices of Gali Yuga are Illicit connection with women, animal slaughter, intoxication, speculative gambling of all sorts. A Goswami must be free from all these vices before he can dare sit on the Vyasa zone. No one should be allowed to sit on the Vyasa zone who is not spotless in character and who is not free from the above mentioned vices. He not only should be free from all such vices, but must be well versed in all revealed scriptures or in the Vedas. The Puranas are also parts of the Vedas and histories like the Mahabharata or Ramayana are also parts of the Vedas. The Acharya or the Goswami must be well acquainted with all these literatures. To hear and explain them is more important than reading them. One can assimilate the knowledge of the revealed scriptures only by hearing and explaining. Hearing is called Shravana and explaining is called Kirtana. The two processes of Shravana and Kirtana are of primary importance for progressive spiritual life. Only one who has properly grasped the transcendental knowledge from the right source by submissive hearing can properly explain the subject. Translation again. The sages said, Respected Sutta Goswami, you are completely free from all vice. You are well versed in all the scriptures, famous for religious life, and in the Puranas and the histories as well. For you have gone through them under proper guidance and have also explained them. Om Ajnana Timurandasya Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshun Navitanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha 
जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत जनाधार श्री वासवी गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे As you know, Nayana Sharanya is still there today, but this section of Bhagavatam is taking you back thousands of years to the Nayana Sharanya, the forest where the sages have gathered to perform a yagya, a sacrifice for the well-being of all human beings. We have this opportunity also to create a spot which will benefit all human beings. According to the quality of the devotees, that will determine how spiritually attractive the place is. At Naya Saranya, you have gathered the sages led by Shona Karishi, and they're questioning Sutta Goswami. First of all, because Sutta Goswami was in the audience when Shukadeva Goswami explained Bhagavatam to Pritchett Maharaj. So you see, in case you haven't noticed, Shiman Bhagavatam contains nested dialogues. One dialogue nested in another. You can definitely say one discussion of saintly persons, the topmost saintly persons, nested into another discussion between topmost saintly persons. So this is how Bhagavatam fully immerses you in Krishna consciousness. The Shastras explain that Naivisha or Naimisharanya, the forest of Naimisha, is a favorite place of Lord Vishnu. Those ruined by impersonalist thinking have a difficult time understanding how Vishnu is non-material and Vishnu has preferences in terms of places, persons, activities. Sometimes we think that the Supreme Personality of Godhead has come to this world, Purichanaya Sadhanam Vanashaya Tradishtana, make to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants. But no, that's a secondary purpose. The real reason why the Supreme Personality of God appears is to display his past times. Personalism. And Krishna knows that by displaying his past times, conditioned souls can be attracted for reviving their dormant love. I was listening to Srila Prabhupada explain how originally everyone is nitya sin, but some of the original nitya sinners have become conditioned souls. So therefore, what the sages and Nainasaranya are doing is discussing the process that will work even in this age of Kali so that conditioned souls can once again become nitya siddha, eternally perfect. <laughs> so it might strike you as a curiosity that the Supreme Personality of God has favorite places. But we are tiny particles of the Supreme and we have favorite places. That's part of personalism. We have favorite people, favorite places, favorite activities. Why do we deny this in the Supreme Personality of Godhead? 
Especially, why do we deny the unparalleled qualities and activities, forms and names of the Supreme Personality of God? Why do we dare to consider all that to be the same as the name, form, qualities and pastimes of a mundane material personality? This is why Krishna protests in Bhagavad Gita, Avajananti Mahmudha. Fools think that I'm an ordinary person. That Krishna has a narrow lila, human pastimes, doesn't mean he's a human being. He looks like a human being, but he is not a human being. In Braj Lila, Krishna is very careful to maintain his human life profile. <laughs> Just like when he kills Putana, he does it in a way that doesn't disturb Mother Yashoda and the other residents of Vrindavan by overpowering them with his ice fire, with his opulence. That overpowering by ice fire is meant more for Dwarka and especially meant for Vaikuntha. But in Goloka Vrindavan or in his Gokul abode, Krishna is very careful to do his wonders in such a way that sweetness always predominates. The Madhuryamrita especially. So when he killed Putana, he didn't do it in a way that would disturb Brother Yashoda and the elder gopis. He sucked her breast, but his sucking was quite different from an ordinary child sucking. He sucked out her life force. And simultaneously, he was squeezing her breast with his hands and kicking her chest with his little feet. She had dared to approach Krishna to kill him. And by the arrangement of Yoga Maya, Mother Yashoda and Rohini Devi said, just step right in, enter the home. This puzzled, later you'll find out, this puzzled Dhamma Maharaj so much. When he came back from Mathura, remember what happened in Mathura? Right before Nanda Maharaj's Departure, Vasudev warned him, I think you should hurry back because there could be some major disturbances. He wanted none of ours to get going. For that reason, he predicted, Vasudev predicted major disturbances. And number two, the Acharyas point out that Vasudev was concerned about the envy of Kamsa because Nanda Maharaj was known to be a very prosperous Vaishya and Kamsa is known to be a very uh, envious person. So because of the wealth of Nanda Maharaj, Vasudev was concerned that you stick around here in Mathura too long and Kamsa could make problems for you, trying to confiscate everything you have. But the main reason you should get going is because I, I foresee danger in your hometown. So please, go right away. So Nanda Maharaj did that. And what was Nanda Maharaj's reaction? upon seeing as he and his associates entered their hometown on big bullock carts. When he saw the, the 18 kilometer long body of Pujana, he was astonished. Is this my home? Like maybe by some mystic potency, I come to the wrong place. Am I really seeing 
what I'm seeing? And then he entered his divine hometown and the residents told him what had happened, how Putana had disguised herself as a most beautiful woman. The original form of Putana is what? An owl. <laughs> they have owls in Australia? Yeah, that's her original form. <laughs> and she can also show her form as a hideous looking witch. But when she entered Krishna's town, she was looking like the most beautiful woman. So much so that Yashoda, Rohini, and the other elder gopis thought, Lakshmi Devi herself has come to bless the child. Just like Lakshmi is attracted to Narayan, similarly to Lakshmi Devi. She's looking so beautiful, this newcomer. Let her step right in. She wants to offer Krishna, little infant Krishna, her breast milk. Sure, sure. How could this happen? It's the arrangement of yoga maya. Krishna wanted to have pastimes and he also wanted to terminate this witch who had killed so many babies. Now please note, she had not killed any babies in Vrindavan, in Braj. That's not possible. But she was threatening to do so and she had killed babies elsewhere. So this is why, this is one reason why Krishna finished her. So she enters the house and she picks up little Krishna, the infant, on her lap. She doesn't know that she's taking on her lap death personified as far as she, as far as regarding her. What Yashoda and the other elder gopis love so much for Putana is the worst death. And so you know, as she put Krishna on her lap and offered him her breast milk to suck, Krishna closed his eyes. She couldn't really understand what she had taken on her lap. But Krishna closed his eyes because, well, there's several reasons. He was thinking, she's a woman, and according to Shastra, I shouldn't kill a woman. So I closed my eyes. Number two reason I closed my eyes is because She's so inauspicious. She's killed so many babies. I don't want to see such an inauspicious entity. There are other reasons also why Krishna closed his eyes. The Acharyas point out that Putana had on her breast such poison that you didn't even, a baby didn't even have to suck it to die just by the babies touching the poison. That's it, finished. So she thought it was going to be a routine slaughter. But as we discussed, Krishna had his method of killing her while at the same time accepting that she did approach me as mother, as a nurse. So he accomplished both purposes. He ended Putana's terrorism, while at the same time, he accepted that she had some kind of maternal motive, although it was so mixed up in terror. This is why the great saints and sages say, who do you know who's more merciful than Krishna? Aho bhakiyam stana kala kutam. Buddha makes that prayer in the third canto. Just see 
He exclaims, Putina offers Krishna her breasts full of poison and Krishna gives her a position in the spiritual world like that of his mother. Who can you find who is so merciful other than Krishna? Part of Krishna's mercy in dealing with Putina is that he didn't kill her in some kind of inconceivable yogic mystic power way. No. He sucked her breath. He's what a normal little child would do, but his sucking is incomparable. So in other words, and this is an important point, the way he killed Putana was done in such a way that it's human-like, although at the same time inconceivable, how a little infant can suck and kick and squeeze with his hands that ferociously. So in this way, Mother has showed us Vatsalya praying her love, maternal love for Krishna was preserved. You know how Putana reacted to her oncoming death. Leave me, child, leave me. She's flailing about. She was crying out until she was exhausted and she couldn't make him any more sound. And she tried to get rid of Krishna, get him off of her, but she couldn't do that. And she wound up going outside the house with Krishna still on her chest, clinging tightly, his hands were clinging tightly to her breast, squeezing the hell out of her breast. And simultaneously, pummeling her with his fists and kicking her with his little baby feet. So as you know, once Putin got outside the house and she's in such pain, she's about to die, she revealed her demoniac form as a rakshashi. Prabhupada in his word for words, if you read 10th canto, you'll find it. He says she was a professional rakshashi. <laughs> that was her occupation. <laughs> mm. So Nanda Maharaj, upon seeing the sight of Putana's 18 kilometer long dead body, was thinking, Vasudev must have been some kind of fortune teller or he must know the future. He must have some mystic power. He foresaw this. But Vasudev is simply being an expert chatriya, an expert administrator warrior. And strategically, he could understand the troop movements, so to speak. He could understand what was going on. But Nanda Maharaj, being a Vaishya, being Goshendra, king of the cowherds, Nanda Maharaj thought, this, he's got mystic power. He can foresee the future. We need a place to gather and discuss Krishna. Just like the sages at Naimisarnia, they gathered. They foresee, just like Vasudeva with his Kshatriya abilities, foresaw problems in Vraj. Similarly, the sages at Naima Saranya, seated before Sutta Goswami and led by Shonakarishi, they see the huge problems of Kali Yuga. By reading this first chapter of Bhagavatam, you'll get a real sense of the extraordinary danger that we are in. Because society is disconnected from the Supreme Personality of God. I love the way Prabhupada makes the point that if you have 
branches and leaves disconnected from the tree? What is the use in watering such branches and leaves? Because they're disconnected from the tree. Similarly, he points out all the remedial measures that human beings today try to correct their situation must fail because the branches and leaves are cut off from the tree. You wouldn't waste your time watering a disconnected branch. Similarly, why should human society waste its time watering trying to correct an amputated limb, a disconnected branch. As Prabhupada writes in the purport to text four, by pouring water on the root of the tree, all the parts of the tree are automatically nursed. Only those branches and leaves which are detached cannot be so satisfied. Detached branches and leaves dry up gradually, despite all watering attempts. Similarly, human society, when it is detached from the personality of God, it, like detached branches and leaves, is not capable of being watered. And when attempting to do so is simply wasting his energy and resources. The modern materialist society is detached from its relation to the Supreme Lord and all its plans, which are being made by atheistic leaders, are sure to be baffled at every step. Yet, they do not wake up to this. So this is one of the main themes of this first chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam. The degradation and disconnection so prominent in this age of coming. You may want to feel that human society is making progress. You may want to think and delude yourself to think that you're living in normal times. Just a few problems here and there. A little bit of economic uncertainty. Some environmental problems that haven't been solved, but basically things are moving in the right direction. But no, you're living amidst such ignorance. And the sages at Nainasranya could see this. They could see what's happening with their sage powers, their sage-like vision. Different, you could say, from Vasudev's Chakriya vision. Very pragmatic, practical, strategic. The sages have the Shastra and they have their sadhu mystic vision. So they knew Kali Yuga is right upon us. So we're going to gather in Nainasaranya for a thousand years trying to sort out what human beings should do. We're going to sit here in this holy convocation, this holy assembly. And we're going to hear from Sutta Goswami. So this is the other theme that's so prominent in this chapter. The gathering of the saintly persons in a place that's a favorite of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and hearing from a qualified person. All these factors mean there'll be success. You want your life to be a success? But real success is not simply career success, property investment success. Real success means, real progress means moving on back to God, moving on the road back to God. Because you're going to lose everything else, but your spiritual attainment will always be with you. <clears throat> But people are so blinded by momentary achievements. And they're willing to just ignore the essentials. That real progress means making spiritual advancement. 
So the sages at Nanusaranya are going to just sit there doing a yajna for a thousand years. They want to come upon the solution. And they know. We'll hear from Sutta Goswami because he's heard from Shukadeva Goswami. And therefore, we're going to be benefited. We'll understand what to do with this impending onslaught of Kali Yuga. It's amazing how we are living in such a bewildered, degraded age, yet we think things are basically all right. Not so bad. There are some problems here and there. <laughs> this first chapter of Bhagavatam helps you to penetrate the fog, pull back the veil, and you can actually see what's going on. People are willing to flourish. They hope for a few moments. And just be content with such ignorance, such material flourishing, which can be annihilated, not simply at the end of life, but any moment it can be annihilated. I was just reading some advice from a big, big global nonprofit organization dedicated to banning nuclear weapons. And so they presented methodology, the procedures for starting a talk with someone about nuclear weapons. <laughs> so they give you the guidelines. Make sure the person's sit, sitting down, do some breathing before <laughs> <laughs> Ascertain. Think about how much you want to say before you say it. See if the person can actually handle the reality of a world with 16,000 nuclear weapons. So this is what we call <laughs> progress. Seeing all this, the sages and dinosaurs they're going to, they're approaching Sutta Goswami. And they show you the success formula in hearing about Krishna, hearing Srimad Bhavadam. They say, most importantly, Sutta Janasi Bhattaram Te. All glories to you, Sutta, because you know the reason why. Krishna appeared from Devaki and Vasudeva. You understand that. That's Vedanta. That is the conclusion of the Vedas. You know it. Besides that, besides your noting, your knowing, as Krishna says in the Gita, Vedais Kusarvaya Veda. By all the Vedas I am to be known. Besides understanding that, understanding Krishna, You've done the supplementary steps of studying all the Shastras. You have not only studied them by hearing, showing them, but you've also explained them, Kirtana. And therefore you have realization. So we want a congregation of devotees who can hear about Krishna and explain Krishna. Then you'll have a congregation that's realized in bhakti experience. What else did the sages of Vamishwanda point out about Sutta Goswami? Ruyus Nigdasya Krishnasya. You have achieved the favor of your spiritual master because of your affection. Affection for the Guru doesn't mean you rub his back. It means you embrace his instructions and his mission. You have affectionately been a genuine disciple. Therefore, you can talk to us. And furthermore, your straight stuff, you are the senior most. 
So from all, by all these reasons. And then of course, you are completely free from vice. As we heard in today's verse. Perspective, Sutta Goswami, you're completely free from all vice. So in this way, the sages of Nanusranya are delineating, they're listing the qualifications for potent Krishna Kata. Talks about Krishna in the place. So just like here you are in a simple warehouse, but because the audience is qualified, the speaker may be qualified. <laughs> There can be the potential for a transcendental experience to ignite. So this is why devotees come together. And the more we have places where devotees can come together and hear about Krishna and explain Krishna, the more you'll see the defeat of Kali Yuga. At least the defeat of Kali Yuga will be for those who take shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. Just like when there's a deluge of rain, for those who have good enough umbrellas, they don't get soaked. Even though for everyone else, they're getting wet. It is also possible that by bhakti, the material energy can become more favorable. Although a pure chanter of a holy name is not, doesn't have that as a goal, but still it's possible, a shadow effect. The real chanters of Krishna's glories, of course, are aiming for pure bhakti. Still it can't be denied, the shadow effect. So this chapter is teaching you to penetrate the fog and see what's actually going on in Kali Yuga. Massive unqualification. Massive distraction. Empty promises. Empty hopes. Putting water on a disconnected branch with its leaves and thinking things will get better. So we have to challenge this false optimism that we have. It's not so bad. Things could be worse. Even if we live, even if we would live in a problem-free world, <laughs> which is practically impossible in Kali Yuga, unless the whole planet becomes Krishna conscious, even if we would think to live in a problem-free world, we have the problem of being kicked out of this body, which will disrupt all our hopes, all our plans, all our dreams. So the sages of Nanashwani, they see all this ignorance so clearly. And by studying this first chapter, you get a feel for what's really going on. And then you see the success formula. If we have a congregation that can gather and with qualification discuss Krishna's glories, the fog of Kali Yuga, at least for the congregation, will, will be dissipated. And depending on the strength of the bhakti, even the material energy can be can reduce in its severity. <clears throat> I was explaining a few days ago at Melbourne Mahaprabhu Mandir. How yes, chanting and hearing about Krishna is for the purpose of developing pure bhakti. You're not must supersede it. That's the only thing that will satisfy the self, as Bhagavatam teaches us. Still, I was hearing Shiva Prabhupada explain that because devotees were telling him, oh, in this third world country there's this disaster, in another third world country we're preaching and there's that disaster, earthquakes, tsunamis, this, that, the other. And Prabhupada said, 
You tell those people in those places, if they chant Hare Krishna, become Krishna conscious, all these material miseries will go away. So that shadow effect is there, but it's not what the pure bhaktas focus on. But still, the possibility is there. So you're starting off here with a humble beginning. And it's wonderful to see how you are all coming together. Even the children are here. Everything the little children do is being noted down. They don't understand what they're doing. But just by their bowing down, just by their being present in the kirtan, it's noted for their spiritual advancement. And what to speak of the adults who can consciously, purposely engage in expanding Krishna's glories. So we're very happy that you all have this place where you can come together. And we know it's just a precursor, it's a forerunner of much greater things. And the central focus of whatever place you have, whether a warehouse or a majestic palatial temple, the central purpose is coming together and hearing about Krishna, chanting Hare Krishna. That's what brings the life. And then the more you try to reach out to others, the more Krishna consciousness will be available to you. We were explaining Sunday, last Sunday, how you can begin as a Kanishtha as a third class devotee, just thinking the deity in the temple, that is my focus. But by that kind of concentration, you become purified and you start to understand there are people suffering out there. What can I do about it? And then you enter the platform of a Madhya Madhakar, a second class quality, which is a big category. So we want to see this congregation grow and the engine, the dynamic engine of spiritual growth of the congregation is hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, explaining Krishna to others, and certainly caring for one another. This is the nature of a bhakti community. Hearing, chanting, explaining, and caring. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions? I didn't understand the second part. We're going to have the same purpose of what? Well, that's what he's asking that the sages and Dainas run you gathered to devise a solution for the onslaught of Kali Yuga. So he's saying, Dvija Pitambara Prabhu is saying, we have gathered here. Okay, we're hearing about Krishna, but maybe we're not thinking so much about the welfare of others. That's why I explain how a Kanishtadakari changes to a Madhyamadakari. Kanishtadakari is Bhaktabha, shadow of a devotee, Prabhupada would explain. It's an auspicious beginning, but it's not the full thing. <laughs> But if you go on with your focus on just the deity in the temple, which is very important, 
You, your vision expands and you become aware. There are people suffering out there. What are we going to do about it? How can we bring them into the fold? So the congregation will expand. Because we're servants of Mahaprabhu, Nichananda Prabhu, we are expansionists. There's nothing we can do about that. It's in our DNA, our spiritual DNA. Bigger, 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 bigger. More, more, more. Krishna's unlimited. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. You have to speak very loudly. Project your voice. In the previous class, we were speaking about minimal engagement with the material energy. He's saying in a previous class, I was speaking about minimal engagement with the material energy. He had a question on his mind. <laughs> Where to draw the line? Where to draw the line? What's the sign that we're getting too caught up in the material energy? Mm, that's why it's always good to have guidance. Bhakti is a guidance culture. So, you have your spiritual master, you have the senior vice -trans. The more guidance, the more wealthy you are. So the more you leave yourself open for taking advice, for guidance, the more you can handle the complexities of existing in this world. And there'll always be such complexities. <laughs> So the intelligent devotee has his or her mentors. So many of the intricacies that we encounter in our existence as devotees, they're not rocket science. There's always someone, some devotee who's seen it all before. And you can take advice. Yes? Uh, I'm just thinking my question is that when we take some guidance from senior devotees, roughly how many senior devotees share their guidance from? Because they say mm -hmm. the one that served with many masters is the servant of no master. Mm -hmm. so, if you are confused, you can always ask your spiritual master. But my point is that generally the intricacies we encounter on the bhakti path are not something that has never been seen before. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but still, if you are confused or doubtful, well, this one says this, that one says that, you can always ask your spiritual master for clarification. And that way you can feel there's a, the, the buck stops somewhere. <laughs> But I say that so many of the routine problems that devotees encounter can easily be solved by older devotees. They're not so complex. There's nothing new under the sun. You've been around 40, 50 years, you see just rerun movies. <laughs> Just like Bhakti Prabhu, he's seen it all. <laughs> Still, coupled with that, what I just said, if you have some confusion or doubt, or don't know, this one says this, that one says that, you can approach your spiritual master. Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena seva. So I give you a two-dimensional answer. I don't think that so many of what we call problems are anything really that complex that the old timers can't answer. It. But nevertheless, if you feel that there's some mm, confusion in your mind, then you approach your spiritual answer. Anything else? 
Yes. The point that I'm sorry, who made? I was just thinking about the point that this previous devotee mentioned. That in your case, she, she's thinking about the point I'm repeating because not everyone over here can hear. That if you follow many masters, if you follow many masters, yes, so she's saying, when in doubt, because all the masters serve Prabhupada, when in doubt, turn to Prabhupada. I think what he's referring to is like some devotee will tell him, Nikeshri, you need to work a job nine to five and make lots of money, set yourself up for, house, for household life. And others say, no, no, just live simply, have ample time for reading and chanting, support yourself, yes, but don't get carried away. And so. <laughs> Some say, you face me, face it, you need to get married right now. <laughs> others will say, oh, just be careful. <laughs> Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> But I mean, oh, who do I listen to? <laughs> yeah, 26? 26, oh no, some say, now I've got to press the button, and <laughs> <laughs> others say, no, no, hold on, hold on, you're still a young man. That's what he's referring to. He's not referring to some doctrinal issue. <laughs> surrender by being around persons who are surrendered and therefore again we have this place to give association so that persons can hear and chant about Krishna amidst surrendered souls and in that way newcomers will make spiritual advancement by rubbing shoulders with such surrendered souls Bhakti is contagious, more contagious than COVID. <laughs> so it, everything depends on who you associate with. So I wish you all the best in expanding this outpost so that it becomes a major chakra. <laughs> And this is a very auspicious beginning. I really love these photos. Who designed this situation? Very stunning. <laughs> so you have to start somewhere by gathering at such a place. And this is just the beginning. Every thing has to start at the beginning. So it's exciting to see how you've come together and how you're going to grow. Just like parents are always excited about how their children grow, right? Oh, now she's walking, now she's talking, now he's doing this, now he's doing that. Similarly, it's much more exciting to see how the congregation of devotees grows. And you'll take pride in that. And it's rightful pride because it's what Krishna wants. You can take pride in what Krishna wants. All right. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Thank you.